Well, good morning and welcome to Kennewick First United Methodist Church as we gather together in this virtual way to worship this God who loves us. Here we are on this last Sunday of the season of Christmas heading into Epiphany, which will happen later in the week and then moving on into our next seasons of the Christian calendar. But I am so glad that you are here to worship with us, to gather with us and celebrate that God loved us enough to become human and show us the way that leads to life. Friends, welcome to church. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning at Kennewick First United Methodist Church. We're so glad you could join us this morning. We're going to get right started with God Rest You, Merry Gentlemen. God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save God, our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came and 
Well, normally during this time in the service, I'd ask you to stand up and move around the sanctuary and greet the people around you, wish them good morning, and, and pass the peace of Christ to one another. But since we're not in the same room together, we can do that virtually. I'm going to ask you to take just a, a moment or two and send a text message or send an, an email or maybe pause this video and make a phone call to somebody and, and wish them a, a happy Sunday and pass the peace of Christ to someone. Let them know that you're uh, thinking about them and that uh, we are still all together even though we can't be in the same place. So friends, take just a moment to pass the peace of Christ to someone. Well, let me invite you to join me in this opening prayer as we close out this season of Christmas together. Let's pray. Lord, as we gather here in this virtual way uh, around screens and around kitchen tables, Lord, we pray that as we come to the end of a year that has been so difficult, that your spirit would infuse hope and love and peace and joy in us as we move into our next year. Lord, we pray that as we come to the end of this season of Christmas and as we move into the rest of the calendar that allows us to relive this story, Lord, we pray that your spirit will rekindle hope in us. Lord, we pray that we will see the world through your eyes. And Lord, we pray that we will be instruments in your hand that bring about hope and joy and love and peace that can only be found in you. Lord, we give ourselves to you this morning as we worship you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, each Sunday I express my, my gratitude and my appreciation to all of you who have been so faithful in supporting Kennewick First United Methodist Church and the work that we do around here. Uh, during this last uh, few weeks of Advent and coming into the Christmas season, we've had so many programs and put together things like a drive-in um, uh, candlelight Christmas Eve service and and um, all kinds of programs that we've just been able to fill up during the um, the Advent season and I am so thankful for you all in supporting us and helping us to continue to do those things that have such meaning and such importance to us as a community and make a difference in our community around us as well and so thank you for uh, being so faithful and so supportive of the things that we do here at Kennewick First United Methodist Church. You know, if you would like to uh, help us to continue to do those things and make a financial contribution, you know, you can do that in a, a number of ways. One way is you can go to our church webpage at kennewickfirst.com, uh, and up at the uh, right-hand corner, there's uh, a little button that you can click uh, that says Give, and you can make a, a donation that way. Or if you want, you can make a, uh, a donation right from your smartphone. If you text 779, or excuse me, text Kennewick First, all one word, to 77977, uh, you can make a donation right from your smartphone, or you can do it the old-fashioned way, and you can put uh, a check in the mail and mail it to us that way, too. But I just want to express my thanks to all of you who have helped us continue to be this church that God's called us to be. Thank you, my friends. <music>
me in a liturgy of prayer as we give thanks to God for the gifts that he's given to us and we ask for God's help in times of need and in times of trouble. Friends, would you join me in prayer? For the gifts of friendship, family, and communities of love. give you thanks. We pray for those who feel lonely, isolated, and afraid. Lord, hear our prayer. For first responders and medical personnel in harm's way to keep us safe. Lord, hear our prayer. For those dealing with health issues, illness, and disease. Lord, hear our prayer. For our local government officials in the Tri-Cities. Lord, hear our prayer. For our elected officials and leaders of our state. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our nation and other world leaders. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask all of these things, Lord, as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. The Gentiles bless Zion. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around, and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Our second reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, Book 2, verses 1 through 12, Wise Men from the East. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, 
for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. The word of the Lord. Well, again, welcome to Kennewick First uh, during this worship service that we are celebrating together on this last Sunday of the season of Christmas. For those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Christian calendar and what that is about, you know, uh, we have a, a calendar with seasons on it that helps us kind of relive the story of, of God's work within humanity. And it goes, it reminds us of all the things from creation through Jesus' birth to uh, Christ being risen from the dead. And, and all of those seasons remind us of, of this story that is continuing to be lived out in us and in all of God's creation. And so here we are at the end of the, the season of Christmas. It's kind of a, a short season. It's only 12 days. Um, I know that many of you right now are singing in your head the 12 days of Christmas. And so you can, uh, whatever day we're on today, but uh, you can sing that in your head uh, and uh, imagine Lord's a leaping if you would like to. But uh, coming up this week, the, the celebration that marks an end of the Christmas season is a day that we call Epiphany. Uh, I can remember Epiphany because my sister's birthday is on Epiphany. But Epiphany is, is usually a story uh, or a day that we remember the story about the, the, the wise men coming to visit Jesus. And there's lots of, of um, I don't want to say controversy, but for, for people who are kind of like me that, that love to have things ordered in a nice, succinct way and being able to connect dots nice and cleanly. There's some, some controversy about when did the wise men actually show up. Was it, uh, you know, in our, our nativity scene that we have on the altar behind us, we have the wise men and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and the baby and the sheep and the goats and everybody's there all at the same time. But in reality, the, the wise men probably showed up uh, much later. Last week, I kind of mentioned a little bit about that, that uh, we have, in fact, that at least a month has gone by because Mary has gone to the temple to, to perform her sacrifice and do the rites that the law requires of her. And they've been able to, to make their way back to, to Bethlehem. And, uh, and so there's been some time that has, has passed anyway. Some people say it may, as, may have been as much as two years, but, but who knows. But in this story, we have this, uh, this um, unfolding of a, a journey that takes place. We have these, these men who are wise men or who were uh, uh, maybe even astronomers who, uh, as a practice, kind of kept watch on the heavens and uh, took record of the stars and their movement and understood that there was something about the heavens that was going on that, that pointed to something bigger than us, right? And as these, these wise men or these magi, or we can go into the whole controversy of, of who they were, whether they were kings or whether they were uh, some kind of um, early scientist or, or whoever they were, as they were watching the sky and as they noted this, this new light that appeared in the sky, um, they recognized that it was symbolic of something big that was happening, right? And as the story goes, after they saw that light, they began to to follow that light, um, hoping that it would lead them towards this miraculous news that they expected to, to happen because of this light. Now, I, I, I missed the, the chance to go out and see the, the planets. Was it Jupiter and Mars that were coming together? Every time I went out, it was either too late or it was cloudy or it was smoky. But, but thanks to you all, you all took pictures on Facebook and sent them to me, so I at least got to see it on my computer. But, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things about what that star of Jesus was or the star of Bethlehem. But however this story unfolds, right, we have these, these wise men who recognize that something miraculous is happening, and they, they go ahead and, and they make 
this long journey, and, and they don't first head to Bethlehem, they head to Jerusalem, right? And they, they meet with the man in charge there, a guy named Herod, and we've talked about Herod a number of times. Herod was not uh, a particularly kind or thoughtful person. Uh, in fact, Herod was um, somebody that probably would have been charged for war crimes in our uh, culture today. But as they meet with Herod, and Herod uh, has his own wise men come and kind of put the puzzle pieces together that this king of the Jews, this Messiah, who is going to be born, is going to be born in Bethlehem, and tells the wise men where it's going to happen, and then tells them to, hey, come back and tell me where he is so that I can go back and worship him also. And of course, we all know, because we get to read the rest of the story, we know that that's not what his intent was at all. And in fact, he's pretty insecure about this whole thing and that maybe there's a new king, which means he's not going to be king anymore, right? But, you know, beyond the story of the wise men and all that it entails and all, all the things that are a part of it, and, and we might talk a little bit more about this idea of, of Herod and his insecurity about being uh, replaced as king. But, but the thing that fascinates me most about this story is that it, it begins with this light that appears, this, this light in the heavens, right? You know, whether, it, whether it's a star, but, but all these wise men know is that there's, there's this new light that hasn't been there before and, and it appears in the heavens. And, you know, this image of light is something that we see over and over and over again when we hear scriptures about Jesus. And I'm fascinated by this idea of, of light being a, a symbol that we can relate to who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. You know, when I was a kid, my, my dad had one of those big, huge lanterns, you know, the, the big camping um, uh, flashlight that was, you know, about this big and had a, a light about that big around. And we had to get those lantern batteries. Remember those lantern batteries that weighed like four pounds that you had to put inside them? And, and uh, you know, that light, I can remember that light being so bright on my dad's uh, big, uh, I think it was a Coleman lantern that, that he had, but that he could shine. I mean, you could almost write your name on the wall. It would just burn things into the wall. That thing was so bright. And when we would go camping, we would take that and we would shine that light up into the clouds and it just seemed to go forever, right? It was so bright. And I remember um, looking at that, that lantern and, and seeing how so much light came out of this little teeny bulb that was part of that, that big, huge flashlight. And I remember thinking that, that it took such a huge battery. I mean, the thing was huge. And, and it took that huge battery to make such a bright light out of such a little element, right? I've always been fascinated by, by the way light works and how light functions. I mean, that lantern could put off so much light, but it took so much energy. You had to use that, that huge battery to make that little light give off such a, a bright light. And, you know, I'm fascinated about how, how light responds to those things. You know, it, it takes a lot to make light. It takes a, a lot of work to make light. I mean, you've got to, if you want to go through the scientific principles, you've got to excite some kind of a filament and make the, the electrons move in such a way that they give off light as they do it. And, and it's quite a, a process, right? And now that, you know, technology is getting uh, better and better, you know, you can have pretty bright flashlights that run off of little teeny batteries now. But, but still, the, the ability to, to make light is something that requires a, a lot of work. And I'm amazed that this image of light is the image that we have for Jesus. I mean, over and over again, we have this image of light. Here in the scripture reading today, the whole thing that starts this journey for the wise men and, and allows them to recognize that something miraculous is happening is a light that appears in the heaven, right? I mean, over the season of Advent, as we've been preparing and expecting for the, the comings of Jesus, and, and we read passages of Scripture that happened centuries ago, like, like the passage from Isaiah 9, and, and he uses this image of light. He says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in a land of deep darkness, a dawn has shone. You know, in... in John chapter 1, when John tries to explain to us what this whole idea of Jesus coming to earth, what the idea of, of God's word becoming flesh, of God becoming human with us, when he tries to explain that to us in John chapter 1, he uses the image of light as well. He says, in him was life, and that life was a light to all of mankind. The light shines in darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness testifying to that light, although he was not that light. He himself was not the light, but the one true light was coming into the world. I mean, this image of of light is used over and over again. If we were even to go beyond our our scriptures, you can look back to some of the great Wesleyan hymns like, like, And Can It Be? There's this wonderful, I mean, that hymn just, it brings tears to my eyes when I I, uh, sing that that hymn over again as as we uh, belt out, And Can It Be? And there's that wonderful verse where it says, Fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eyes diffused a quickening ray, I woke and the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off and my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and I followed thee. I mean, that image of a dungeon flaming with light. This image of light is something that we see over and over again when we hear about the the coming of Jesus or God becoming human and showing us this way that leads to light, leads to life. You know, there's some interesting things, and part of the reason why this is one of my favorite metaphors for who Jesus is, is this idea of light, is, is that there's some things that, that are special about light. One of the things that I love about this metaphor is that light overcomes darkness, right? It's not as if you could take my, my dad's camping uh, flashlight that had the big, huge 9-volt lantern battery in it, and you could walk into a, a dark room, and you could walk into the darkness and turn that light on, and the darkness would just be too much, and the light wouldn't work. That's not how light works, right? No matter how dark the room is, no matter how, much, uh, how many doors are closed, how many windows are closed, when you flick that light on, in the, uh, on the flashlight and the, the uh, electrons excite and light is given off, darkness goes away. Now, you may not be able to get rid of all of the darkness, but, but darkness can't squish out the light, right? The light drives away the darkness. I love that that is a metaphor for Jesus. You know, the other thing that, that's important to remember about light is that light is, or, or at least that darkness is the absence of light. It is not that darkness can, can snuff out light. It's just that darkness is a place, becomes a, a reality in places where there's no light. And when I think about that idea, too, that, that darkness can't overcome light, but light overcomes darkness, and that's a, an image for who Jesus is, you know, I, I think of all the places that are still pretty dark in the world, and I'm using that metaphorically. You know, the the thing that brings about darkness is either something gets in the way of the light, right? You can be in the shadow of the light and not be able to um, be able to to see it. Um, Something has to block the light from, from happening. And I'm reminded that as we enter this season of Christmas and as we move on through Epiphany and on to the, the, the other seasons of the year, as we're called to be disciples of Jesus, we, we're ambassadors of that light and we're the ones who carry that light, right? And the way that we can carry light into places that are dark are a number of ways. I mean, one of the ways that we can carry light into dark places is that we can get rid of whatever that thing is that's blocking the light, right? I mean, we can break down the barriers that that block the light of God from reaching uh, other people. We can break down the barriers of injustice or or evil or all those things that that are part of our baptismal vows, right? I mean, that's one way that we can be an ambassador of light is just to remove the things that, that block light from shining into our lives, You know, the other thing that we can do is that if we're in a place where light isn't shining and something's blocking it, you know, we can move. Uh, One of the the greatest things that I think we do as disciples is help people find a place where they can stand in this light that transforms them. I mean, for lots of people, being able to to just move their their point of view or be able to move their place into a a spot where all of a sudden they're in that light uh, of Jesus and things begin to transform. I mean, one of the great ways that we can show people this love of Jesus is sometimes by just saying, you know, maybe you need to move out from behind that thing and come out here where the light's shining. And here's the thing I love best about being able to shine or be someone who brings uh, light into darkness. This is my favorite thing about, about this metaphor. 
If you can't get rid of the thing that's blocking the light, or maybe you can't move to get out from behind that thing, one of the best ways to get light into dark places is to reflect it there, right? I can remember um, a, a friend who uh, was uh, in the army, and he was part of the, the Signal Corps way back when, and I don't think they ever actually used that, but part of his training he had to, to learn Morse code and, and other things. And, and he could use a mirror, and he could shine a mirror, and he could shine the sun and make it flash, and he could uh, send signals that way. And he had learned how to do that when he, um, as part of his training in the army. And it dawns on me that, you know, sometimes as disciples of Jesus, our job is to just be reflectors for this light of Jesus. Our job is to just be able to, to reflect the light and the love of God into places where light has a hard time finding its way there. I mean, there's, there's really those three ways that we can, we can deliver this light of Jesus, this if we're going to carry this metaphor any further, I mean, we can either destroy the things that, that block the light and get rid of those things like, like evil and injustice and oppression and all of those things. We can either help people move and find their way into the light or we can, by our own reflection of the love that Jesus has shown us and the love that we show others, we can reflect that light in the places where darkness seems to dwell. I mean, it seems that as disciples... We have this ability to to share this light that Isaiah was talking about, that John was talking about, because truly the light of the world has has come into the world, and, and we have an opportunity to share the hope and the life and the joy that comes from a relationship with Jesus. And we have this opportunity to be bearers of that light. So I hope that as we move forward from this season of Christmas and we move into the the rest of our year and as we we talk about what it means to be disciples of Jesus, I hope that we never lose sight of the fact that we have an opportunity to help this light that changes the world reach into dark places. And as disciples of Jesus, we're called to be carriers of that light into the world. Amen. 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 I am so thankful for the baby who came in the manger, who became Jesus, our Messiah and Savior. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing.
So let me offer this benediction to you this morning on this last Sunday of the season of Christmas. Go from here celebrating that we serve a God who loves us. Go from here rejoicing that we have the honor of carrying that light that transforms the world into the dark places as disciples of Jesus. Go from here in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. See, we know.